This episode of Untold Stories is sponsored by Ledin.io. You'll hear more about them later on in this episode. What is up, everyone? I am Charlie Shrem, and you are listening and watching Untold Stories, where twice a week together, we get to dive deep with some of crypto's most influential leaders, brightest crayons in the box, sharpest tools in the shed, to understand how this movement came to be, where we are right now, where we're going. And my favorite part of doing this show is when I randomly get to interface again with with old friends that we were doing other things in pre-Bitcoin days. And uh, my guest today, Han Kao, thank you, Han, for so much for coming on Untold Stories today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, known you for a while now, and uh, it's a I, you know, big fan of Untold Stories, so very happy to be here today. We... Um, we go. Our history together goes back. We were just chatting about it. Goes back probably ten years in in the early days of of Bitcoin. You were, you know, just like myself, hustling and and trying to earn our spurs and 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 build our businesses and our empire on the streets of New York City. This was when I was uh, uh, just starting Bit Instant in 2011, 2012. You were uh, uh, getting into hospitality marketing and and doing a lot of software. You had founded Metrofunk.com in 2006, which was the world's first social networking site built and run by trendsetters. And you had all of the famous like 90s and early 2000, you know, celebrities on there like John Mayer, Ashley Simpson and everything. And I want to talk to you about that a little later, like how timing is everything and how social networking and social media timing was really everything when it came to Facebook in 2004. You're also the founder of CryptoBriefing.com, which is, uh, I didn't realize this, but your scoring mechanism and your reporting that you guys have done analyzing and investing in crypto. You've, you've made some some amazing calls and, and putting out some great content, over 4,000 articles since 2013. And one of the coolest things that you've done, and I was just I was just um, on your website, Sanctor.com, is you created uh, Sanctor Capital, which is really great because I love when, when folks who are in this industry take you know uh, what they've learned and what they've done and start to mentor the new entrepreneurs and the new folks and the new startups and the ones that are that are uh, uh, going to be like the next wave of what we're all investing in and what we're utilizing in our infrastructure. So Sanctor Capital is a thesis driven investment manager and um, you're you're incubating and helping a lot of these new businesses and these new projects and ideas. You just had your Turbo Demo Day. So it's a six week course, Sanctor Turbo. And you just had your demo day a few weeks ago and you had some amazing speakers there uh, from Coinbase, Solana. You had Oh my God, I'm looking at who, who is there and who is speaking. What I really want to know, and I know I just gave a whole mouthful. There's so much to talk about. I want to know, tell me about the demo day. Who are the type of companies? What are they building? How are the entrepreneurs? Like, let's go through them. I'm excited about this. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. Thanks for that uh, really kind intro, Charlie. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think for demo day, you know, we really wanted to figure out a way where we were able to really get behind uh, the founders and I'll qualify founders where, you know, we, we look for missionary founders. We look for founders that are on a mission uh, beyond just, you know, build, getting a coin out, uh, trying to make some money, but they really have a vision for their, for what this world will look like in two years, three years. And they want to be part of, uh, of, of, of navigating that, that vision. And so, yeah, so we found three, you know, just kind of answer your questions. We, um, we found three amazing projects um, with very missionary teams that have um, just a lot to bring to, uh, to, to the crypto uh, ecosystem. Uh, one of them was a project called uh, Koi. Um, and what they are is there are a few things. They have an SDK. Uh, but they're playing in the NFT market. And what they essentially allow people to do is to um, actually have real ownership of the NFTs. You know, all the NFTs today, everyone uses the word NFTs, but what you really own is a, uh, a token to the pointer, the pointer of where, uh, where, where the actual data is. And so you can, that data can move somewhere else. It could be something else. And, and you don't have any control of that. But um, Koi is basically building out a set of tools that allows you to have true ownership of and dictate where that data sits, if that data is going to be replaced, um, and other, other really fun stuff. Um, a, another project that was that graduated on Demo Day 
uh, was a project called Thor Swap. Um, and ThorChain is a, you know, I'm sure you know what ThorChain yeah. is, uh, uh, you know, uh, and so they're the, the largest uh, layer, decentralized layer, uh, uh, exchange layer on top of the ThorChain ecosystem. Uh, and so they were, they started getting, they had a lot of traction. They were doing something like 1 billion um, a month in volume before uh, the ThorChain ecosystem got paused. And, and then it was around that time when we found them and we, you know, they were, they said, you know, Hey, you know, we'd love to kind of partner up and, and, um, and, and build this together. And so, yeah, the, you know, missionary founders, uh, these guys are kind of behind some of the, um, the original ThorChain code um, and, and some of the core developers behind that. Um, and then finally, the, another project was called, is called Synchrony, uh, which is a index play on Solana that is looking to make DeFi easy. Um, you know, one of the problems that we're seeing in uh, DeFi right now is that there's kind of a mismatch between the sophistication of the tools, um, the sophistication of the, uh, and, and the necessity to the, the knowledge curve for, uh, for finance and for technology um, is much higher than um, what the current crypto market participants, um, you know, kind of like currently possess. And uh, it's getting more and more complicated. And so uh, they're trying to kind of come back a little bit and, and, and simplify a lot of that through uh, the user experience. Yeah. Do you think that there's more demand for users? There is more user demand for blockchains and dApps than there are dApps and blockchains to service those users in the high quality way that these users want to be serviced? So I think there's much more demand than there are products right now in the way that they want to be serviced, you know, and it's like the markets move really, really, really fast. Yeah. But technology and evolution of development of these technologies and, and financial primitives move at the rate at which people can build and test and get audited, right? And so it's not exactly keeping pace with um, the demands of the, the user in terms of the experience. Um, although, you know, we are seeing kind of the initial primitive layers and second order layers uh, of, of financial products being built at the, 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 you know, the, t the high layer uh, where you, you can kind of abstract a lot of these, uh, these, these financial mechanisms uh, and the, and the, and, and the, you know, the complications behind uh, these DeFi products are yeah. um, that's not quite there yet. Yeah. What, I mean, what is this? I want to get back to this missionary founder idea because it seems like, you know, I'll, I'll ask a lot of the guests, what's a, a trait that you look for in an entrepreneur or what's something specific? And there are a lot of things that we know are there, but we can't put words to them. This missionary founder idea, uh, I like this. I want to dive into it a little bit more. And is that like a key trait that you almost like need to see in, in like the executive team or the founders of a, of a project that you're going to invest in or mentor or whatever? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I would say that's kind of like, that's one of the main, um, that's probably one of the main uh, pillars of, of our framework like when it comes to investing in, you know, uh, for Sancto Turbo. Um, and, you know, a, a missionary founders is, and, and, and I actually, you know, I borrowed this from uh, John Dora from Kleiner Perkins, who kind of almost coined that term missionary founder. Um, and, and he defines, you know, the, um, a, 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 a missionary founder as someone who's able to do um, a lot more than what other, think, other people think is possible with a lot less um, with a, you know, uh, a commitment to uh, a mission and actually prioritizes the values um, and the purpose of the company beyond financial statements, KPIs and whatnot. And, the, and, and it's this type of founder that has the ability to evangelize a core team. Um, and so with crypto, you have very, very volatile markets. You've got bull markets where uh, everyone's expectations are really high. And then you have bear markets where everyone's expectations are, are well, uh, people are very yeah. disappointed, <laughs> right? No matter how hard you work, no matter yeah. how much progress you make, you, nothing moves the needle, right? And this, uh, and so, you know, in crypto, it's even more important because um, it's important for founders to be able to kind of align the team um, and keep everyone in check, you know, keep, keep a level head 
um, and focus on the mission and focus on the values and disregard some of the short term, um, you know, excitement or, or disappointments uh, when it comes to price and volatility um, and focus on the actual mission. And these are the type of companies that over time we've seen survive. Yeah. Um, you know, and yeah. Survival is existence. Yeah. Absolutely. Especially in our space. Like the ones that are, that are around today are ones that just have been able to survive and adapt and grow, a, a, you know, at least somewhat with the market, even a little bit, but with, of course, some standard deviations. But I mean, that's survival is everything. You're 100% right. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I can draw from a little bit of my own experience, you know, where at times, you know, when, when, we, when we were running crypto briefing, um, there's been, there were some rough times during the middle of the bear market, yeah. you know, where there was no signs of, you know, things turning around. And at times you almost have to sacrifice a lot of your personal, um, everything, you know, uh, ambitions, um, you know, time, uh, financial, um, you know, freedom to stick it out and build something that you really true, you know, truly feel passionate about and believe in. Um, and if it wasn't for this higher order driving force, then it does, it really just wouldn't have made sense to continue. Um, and so I kind of see, I try to find founders that kind of had that higher order um, motivation because when there's no more money on the table and there's no more glory, um, there needs to be something else to drive you. I want to say too, though, there, there are a lot of, I have friends who didn't make it during multiple, multiple bear markets over a decade. And there's almost like a shame that they have that they couldn't wear it out. And I want to tell you, like, mo it's hard to wear out. Though. There should be no shame and guilt if you had to go, if you worked in crypto and you left and you get to do something else and you want to come back because it's a very difficult thing to do. If I wasn't in prison during the 2015 bear market, I don't know if I would have been able to survive and hold. That was long. That was like a two year bear market. I mean, like, Really, people thought this whole industry was dead at that point because nothing, I mean, bear market is when nothing, no good news affects the price or any development or everything like inflows just die. It's so, it's so kind of crazy. It's just, it's just pure and utter despair, you know, and I, if it wasn't, so I actually lived and worked through the first dot-com bubble. Uh, I had a web development shop in 1999. Um, and in 2000, when the market crashed, you know, I think we, we, we sold at a fraction of what we could have gotten like just a month before April of 2000. Oh and, you know, I, I got quite disillusioned and I basically left tech for, for many years, um, because I was like, ah, this internet thing, what oh, a sham. What did you and do? It, it was, um, well, I can't imagine. Uh, First off, I was a college dropout, so I went back to school at the time. Uh, and then when I when I graduated from, uh, I went to Columbia uh, for econ. When I graduated econ, I was like, well, should I, you know, should I go out and be a banker? Like I'm basically and be a good good RV grad. And like I'm groomed <laughs> to be. Um, and then you know I went on all these interviews and uh, I I had read this book Monkey Business and I it just really turned me off. The whole banking industry just really turned me off. Uh, and so I, I ended up, you know, kind of going back to my entrepreneur roots and said, okay, let me give it another go at it and, and start another startup. I ended up starting a, uh, a niche social network in 2006 and, um, no, sorry, that was uh, 2004 and it was by the name of, it was called Metro Funk. It was like a, uh, you know, a social network for events, fashion, music, and film. We completely bombed. It was like the 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 like the an utter. It was just straight straight downhill right after we came out. But what we did really well was we did a lot of launch parties for this for the social network, and the launch parties were an amazing success. We had a lot of like celebrities come, and you know, and and it did really well. And then that kind of somehow evolved into a very successful ten year business that also. Uh, involved, you know, evolved into an online ticketing company, um, which I might add was actually my first touch with Bitcoin in 2013. And it was, you know, we were dealing with, we were a ticketing company for, for big events. And so our customers were buyers of these tickets that wanted to go to these events. 
And then we would basically, you know, uh, provide, you know, once we collected all the money, we would send it over to the event organizers. But what we found out was that, you know, the, there's a lot of challenges with the with credit card payments and that there's no finality, right? Yes. And so, <laughs> and so we would find out that we would send all this money over to the event organizers and three months later, we would get all these chargebacks from event goers and going, hey, you know, I didn't have a great time at the event or this happened and that happened. Um, I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a refund. And the, the you know, as, as a small ticketing company, really, you have no, no choice but to just give them a refund uh, or, or you lose your account with their gateways. And so uh, we kind of considered, you know, Bitcoin for a little bit. Uh, and that was kind of my first touch. It was a little bit too early at the time. Uh, and so we, we kind of paused there. Yeah. <laughs> And it's so wonderful how the universe brought us together in that moment. At the same time that you were doing that, I was uh, graduating college, running my e-commerce type of online daily deal website, dailycheckout.com. And I was just hanging out in the Bitcoin forums a lot. I wasn't uh, even running BitInstant yet. We had not started that first company. And um, right. I had partnered with with my best friend from from yeshiva from from school and we do what two good yeshiva boys do and we start a nightclub in new york city with with the money that we made promoting parties and you were there it was beautiful but what was so interesting about that is if i if i wasn't doing that i wouldn't know the ultimate utility for bitcoin i wouldn't have never seen it with my true eyes i would have never lost money from the same reason that you lost money and then say to myself Oh my God, because we would have people come into the bar. We'd have them on camera having the best day, ordering multiple bottles of champagne. And then, like you said, two months later, they call American Express. And then now it's like from the nightclub owner or the restaurant owner. This is restaurants. This is a global problem, not just nightclubs, restaurants, bars, anything hospitality. You, you're like at a, your money gets frozen. You're automatically at a guilty until proven innocent. And this is a banking system problem. You can't solve this without like rebuilding a whole new financial infrastructure. So we realized that, hey, Bitcoin is actually great for this. Well, although no one really knows about Bitcoin yet, but we'll push it really hard because if someone comes in and says 10 grand on champagne bottles, it's like awesome. We were one of like BitPay's biggest customers at the time back in 2014. And it was just from revenue from, from the club. People were coming in and we were giving big discounts if they use crypto, if they use Bitcoin, there was no crypto yet. And how crazy is that that's how we ended up having t like like uh, uh, being there talking, but not even realizing that 10 years later, we'd be back doing a podcast together. You did what you did. I did what I did. And here we are. It's like how it's crazy. And that's so and that's what's so cool. And I, I and Charlie, I remember, I remember you. Uh, if I remember correctly, then the, the name of nightclub was like EVR or something like EVR, that. Right? You guys yep. EVR was like the first nightclub in New York City to accept crypto payments. Is that correct? I, yep. I think I remember that being probably one you know, of the first places in the world at that point to do physical yeah. Bitcoin payments. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I remember going, "Wow, that's that's pretty. Uh, that's 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 pretty visionary." You know, there was and, no and mobile I, software at the time to even accept no. Bitcoin payments. You were using a web app. A BitPay would like you have to go to their web app, Safari, on an iPad, scan the QR code with the camera. It was just so janky. But we were proving a point that hey, look at this. This is rebuilding a whole new financial system from like day one. And back then, though, it was just all about Bitcoin. Now we're in this like multi-chain world, multi-coin world. All the companies that you talked about in your in your demo day, it sounds like the theme is interoperability. Like what's what's the deal with that? Why is that so big making connections and relationships between different blockchains? What's the future of all these blockchains? Are we looking at blockchains like is that even term? Am I, is that an old term blockchain? What's the new term? Is it layer ones? Are, are they new <laughs> ecosystems? I feel like I'm using like archaic lingo. Yeah, no, <laughs> uh, I, 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 no, you're, 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 you're not using archaic lingo. Uh, the lingo is primarily still pretty, pretty much the same. Um, you know, the, 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 the reality is, you know, interoperability has been around for years uh, for blockchains, right? You know, they we saw the first interoperable transaction um, through bridges and in 2006, uh, 2008, early 2018. But there was no need for it. There was no need to move assets from one chain to another because there was nothing to do with the assets anyway, right? There was nothing, you couldn't provide liquidity. You, <laughs> you couldn't lend and borrow. Um, and, and, you know, the, 
centralized exchanges were, were just fine. And so you, you go through centralized exchanges. That was the original interoperability. Centralized exchanges was the original. You know, you go in there and you, you, you let them handle the custody and uh, you, you forget about control. Um, I think DeFi really provided that catalyst. You know, DeFi, you know, allow people to kind of bridge assets from one chain to another chain. Um, and, you know, and then you have different scalable uh, scalability issues that basically force a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, um, you know, the, the, the dApps to kind of move on to layer twos, right, from the layer ones. And, uh, and so, you know, if we're, if we want to build a new financial system, um, these financial products need to be able to talk to each other and you need to be able to use one financial product um, in tandem with another financial product. And the only way you can do that is, is with interoperable um, features, right? And so that's kind of what we're seeing now. You know, I think DeFi Summer kicked off a huge catalyst and a lot of excitement and a lot of usage um, and, and you need usage in order to have yeah. demand for layer twos. It seems like the, the, the market looks for like choke points, centralized choke points, and then builds on top of that. And then the market will look for those choke points and create decentralized, you know, alternatives for it. They may not be pretty at first, but then, but they work and then eventually they're pretty. And then, you know, at, at the end of the, at the end of the day, it's removing that trust layer. It's removing a centralized trust layer. Bitcoin was created for removing the centralized trust layer from, from financial transactions, from finance, crypto, NFTs. It's all like following that demand for what we need. And like you said, there was no incentive to have uh, interoperability. So no one was really building on top of it. But then when, you know, you see all of a sudden $60 million NFTs are selling, everyone is going to start building the applications because we're all motivated by money, but not in a negative way. And this is kind of bringing you back to your missionary founders what motivates them? Because most of these people who get involved, yeah, we're following some money, but that's only like a like a like the milk fat layer, the milk fat layer on top. The ones who are really really motivated, like like you and I, when Bitcoin wasn't worth anything, and we're doing because we just feel it's right. What motivates us? I think you know the kind of just circling back to interoperability um, a little bit, you know, and the you know what what motivated. Um, a lot of these products to build interoperability solutions was the management of these assets, right? Without managing infrastructure. So that's the key, right? Like users want to manage their assets, but they don't want to manage infrastructure. They don't want to manage, you know, moving on and off different chains and bridging things on their own. And so it's kind of like circling back to the beginning of our conversation where, where we're talking about is, abstracting more and more layers for the user to the point where they don't need to understand or need to know what they are using, what chains they're using, which, you know, which uh, layers they're, uh, which layer one, layer two, uh, their, their, their assets are on. Uh, they just want to be able to say, I want to move, you know, I want to be able to use this platform. I want to stick assets into this platform. Um, and as, as, as this, you know, as the, uh, the economy grows and, and, um, and and these uh, these tools become more sophisticated. You know, the ultimate goal is that we'll see a lot of this infrastructure management be managed by the applications, and the applications will use and leverage different layer ones and layer twos for whatever is most beneficial for that particular application. Uh, and they're going to leverage the different features of different chains um, for the sake of the user. And that's that's what we're looking for, and that's what we're hopeful for. Guys, we need to talk about how to use your Bitcoin and your USDC to earn you interest and make you more money. To do that, we're going to talk about our newest sponsor, Ledin.io, a much better home for your Bitcoin. They're amazing. They're a secure, simple, and easy to use platform for managing and growing your digital wealth. On Ledin, you can earn interest on your Bitcoin and on your USDC with some of the industry's best rates. Earn 6.1% APY on your first two Bitcoin and 9% on all of your USDC. That's right. All you need to do is deposit your coins and you'll receive steady payouts at the end of each month just for leaving your coins with them. 6.1% on Bitcoin is pretty huge. You don't find that same kind of return elsewhere without taking a much greater risk. And 9% on your USDC 
Think about what kind of rate you'll get if you had dollars sitting in your bank's savings account. Probably almost nothing. If you've got dollar savings sitting around, this seems like a no-brainer. All you need to do to sign up with Ledin is send a bit of Bitcoin or USDC their way and then sit back and let the interest accrue. So what are you waiting for? Go to untoldstories.link forward slash Ledin to start earning interest on your Bitcoin or USDC today. That's untoldstories.link forward slash Ledin. You're going to love them. Enjoy. Why is the government pushing back? so much in a in, in a way that's doesn't seem like very smart like just this morning is it is it a populist thing do do politicians are politicians still doing things in your opinion for for to like appease the normal like the citizens who are not really understanding or looking at crypto like just this morning just now I'm, I, as a recording uh new york attorney general announced that she's sent cease and desist orders to five different crypto lending platforms. I don't know who's part of that. It's just very interesting. Nexo is one of them I saw, and there's a few of them here. Uh, Celsius was one of them. Uh, I don't understand why there's not more conversations or relationships happening. Or is it that I just don't understand diplomacy? And maybe diplomacy requires shots across the bow first before two sides can come to the table. I mean, I don't fucking know him from Brooklyn. What do I know about diplomacy? You know, I, I, I have to say, I, I resonate pretty closely with you and and you know i i think there's there's a lot of different forces at play here right and and so we can't really say you know the the these agencies are all and everyone within these agencies all have a certain directive and all have a certain goal or a mission to take down crypto um we have to we have to kind of understand that there's a gradient there you know there's folks um that are really 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 uh focused on investor protection and protecting the the rights and and the and, and the uh um the the financial safety uh of a lot of the uh, of us residents and citizens yeah. uh and then there's also folks on the other side that are maybe potentially on the brink of power struggles or appealing to the constituents right and so you've got this uh and just like in crypto you've got good actors and bad actors right and so some 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 people that are more self motivated, some people that are more motivated for the greater good. And so what we're seeing is this, you know, kind of this this dynamic kind of happen. Um, and I and you know and and I I do I do feel that you know we I am very very hopeful and and I do feel that um, there will be this fine middle ground that we we are able to both play in and all be happy. That's that's my <laughs> that's my optimistic. Um, I agree. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. at the same time, you're just going to be heads down, helping companies build, building yourself, investing in things. You know, the hardest one of the hardest things to do is take a startup from like zero to one, from one to two to three is one thing from three to four to five, you know, growing, growing from 10 people plus. But going from that, like I have an idea, but is my idea actually worth something or is my idea something that I can build a business and then sustain myself and other people long term? And then it, is my idea going to create an asset that I could eventually sell? Are these the type of questions that entrepreneurs should be asking themselves? Like, do you have any advice for those who may have an idea but struggle to go from even zero to like 0.5 sitting at their jobs and they want to jump into this, but they're afraid? Yeah, absolutely. You know, that that the. The, the idea stage and the early product iteration stage, that is probably the most critical stage. And, and that's my favorite part. You know, I'm a product guy. I've, I've, I've run dozens of, uh, of, of startups and um, I've, you know, failed a good bunch of them, but I've learned from these failures on like how, how to do the next one better. Right. Yeah. And so the, the most critical part is that idea stage and recognizing that it's nothing more than just that. It's nothing more than an idea. Until you actually take that idea into reality, you 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 build either build out an initial product and MVP to get some early validation on your on your concept um, and get feedback on it, right? Because you can't get feedback with an idea. You can get some initial feedback from maybe your buddies and whatnot, but you can't get proper user feedback. And until you get proper user feedback to validate whether or not you're onto something, then it's you're you're still just an idea. You're not a product, and so. The goal is to really fast track that as much as possible with as little risk as possible. Do that, you know, on testnet, do that in, um, you know, in isolated environments, 
and just put a product in front of people and say, what, you know, this is, this, you, 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 you've communicated a certain need and a desire and a problem. What do you think of this product and, and have people play with it? And that's the best way to learn. That's a very brilliant idea. Getting user feedback is usually like the last thing people think to do, right? You're writing a book. You don't want anyone to see it till you finish, but it's almost the opposite. You almost need to have your friends and family and even people who hate you, who are going to be more honest with you sometimes be, you know, like from, from the, the beginning of the idea, as soon as you have like a minimum viable product or whatever, or even call you up or, or speak to people on, well, not on crypto Twitter because they'll make you cry sometimes, but yeah, you know what I mean? I love yeah, it. absolutely. Absolutely. You know, there's, uh, it, you know, the Silicon Valley Bible, right? The lean started by Eric Reese, right? And so, you know, it's really about thinking about, you know, the, uh, the, the, pro the production cycle of, of a product um, differently. It's not product development, it's customer development. It's about developing your customer and understand what your customer wants because they don't initially know what they want. So you need to slowly tease that out of them as they learn what they like what they don't like and then that helps you formulate a product vision um, as opposed to the old way of doing things where you know you kind of a bunch of managers sit in a board meeting they postulate on an idea they think it's going to do great they start hiring a sales force they start building a product out and a year later uh then the sales force goes and communicates back to the management and goes we can't sell this product and then uh and then there basically is no communication between the, the the sales cycle and, and, and the product cycle. So, so that all needs to kind of be reversed and happen all in one at the same time. That's really, um, that's really interesting because you're thinking of like the 1960s and Mad Men and everything. How they're all sitting in a room together, drinking, coming up with ideas. And it's so different because that's one thing that has changed in the past few decades is, is how products and ideas come into the market. Uh, everything starts grassroots now. Even new probably new vaccines, medicines, things like that are starting, you know, in people's basements there. It's, it's definitely, that has changed so much in the past, like I would say since like the the seventies or eighties. Hey, there's one, there's one kind of subject that I want to touch on. Um, I was reading an article about uh, the cost of living. I was reading an article about inflation and about what's going on with the world today and how Bitcoin is like a good, uh, and, and you know, like anti-inflation hedge or like anti irresponsible government hedge. What was it like living in, in Jakarta and, and running businesses there and, and, and things like that? Because I'm just curious, do we view, like we as me and American, do I view consumerism the wrong way? Do I view what is important in life? Maybe this is a nice way to end the show. Like, do I, how, do, how am I wrong about what's important in life? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. And I'll, and I'll tell you, um, you know, while my first touch with uh, crypto was in 2013, I, I kind of saw it as kind of like just an interesting experience, uh, uh, experiment. And it wasn't until I moved to Jakarta, uh, I had a company, uh, a, an app studio get acquired by a local uh, Indonesian me media company. And I, for the first time, was living outside the US, outside of New York City, um, <laughs> and oh in a, you know, full on third world economy. And, you know, mind you, this, this is a, third, the fourth largest population in the world. And the majority of people are not banked. And, you know, I'm in a, in a, in a desk full of uh, probably 60 or so uh, in, in, in my office. And, and my desk is just kind of right next to them. And I'm, I'm hanging out with them, talking to them. I'm realizing none of them have bank accounts. Um, all of them are dealing with inflation issues. Um, all of them are just kind of trying to figure out how to store the value of all their hard work. Uh, that has been converted into the Indonesian rupiah. Uh, and I was getting paid in Indonesian rupiah at the time too. And so I was constantly sending money back, you know, converting it and sending it back into uh, the, the, my U.S. accounts. And, and that's kind of like, and I would see my salary fluctuate by like, you know, 20, 30% on a monthly basis um, because of these, because of the, you know, the, the instability of, of the fiat, um, um, oh my rupiah. God. and, and so that was kind of when I actually fully, fully, um, emerged and became an operator in blockchain. And, uh, that's kind of also when I started, how did people do it? How did people do it? Who didn't have money, to, like who couldn't send money outside of the country. And that's the first thing that they stopped. What were other people doing? Like, what were some kind of like, 
but did they spend try to spend their money instantly on things on like food and things? It was that like there was no savings. Was that kind of how you did it? Yeah. So you know, savings is definitely probably like a you know a second order issue. <laughs> like uh, <laughs> they're just trying to get to the next. Uh, they're just trying to make their bills uh, until the you know until the next paycheck. Um, but you know, even if there are savings, like you know, uh, because of the fluctuations of the currencies, the local mm-hmm. currencies, it just it's it's just a moot it's just a mood exercise right and so the to answer your question what do they do they don't they, there's nothing they can do uh until the the advent of of crypto and blockchain um and and, wow. and all these primitives it, it definitely makes us you know kind of think about what's what's important and and uh and what kind of motivates us going back to that missionary founder idea i'm probably going to title this show missionary founder because it's awesome um, I know other people have coined it but we really <laughs> dove into it and and I've been trying to over like dozens of episodes understand what motivates the crypto founder and I we're starting to finally understand that so Han Cal like thank you so much for coming on untold stories and and spending the time with me today um everyone should check out crypto briefing there's so much free content on there there's so much uh, uh, uh more research reports that you can purchase sanctor capital if you have a good idea you can go right there on sanctor.com uh, we'll have it in the show notes you can submit your project idea you can, you have, you have, uh, just click your mentors page. You have dozens of these awesome mentors. I want to be a mentor. I don't know what I could help with, but if there's anything I could ever help with, please call me. Um, this is amazing. I really appreciate you. Sorry. I'd love to, we'd love to have you as a mentor. Thank you so much for having me. It's uh, great to connect with you again. And uh, uh, it's been so much fun looking forward to uh, hopefully, uh, you know, coming back sometime in the future.